Continuing with our lectures on confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad, first we're going to look at how confidentiality is implemented. Typically, we use access controls and cryptography to protect our valuable information assets. We'll have access controls that include things like locked doors. If the bad guy can't get through the locked door to access your information assets, the bad guy can't read the information assets and violate the confidentiality of them. So a locked door or a security guard that keeps the unauthorized people away from the information assets. These are types of access controls. Another form of access control is something along the lines of permissions, for example on the folder or the actual file that lives on the server or perhaps on the database. So if the permissions say this group of users has read-only permission, then those people are authorized to read the information. But the permissions also include something called a default deny. And that says if you're not on the approved list, you're on the denied list. So permissions will deny access to anyone except those that are on the list for access keeping the bad guy away from the confidential information. The other tool we use is cryptography. Now, cryptography would basically take the sensitive information and encrypt it. In other words, convert it into a form that is not readable by a human. It's encrypted, therefore the bad guy can't understand it. He's aware that the secret, that the message exists, but he doesn't have the ability to decrypt the information and therefore understand the meaning of the valuable information asset. So we'll use access controls and cryptography. So if the attacker can't get to the information, he can't read it. And if he can't read it, he doesn't know what the secret is. And if the attacker is looking at encrypted information, he knows that there's information there, but he just can't understand what the information is. So that's the way we would implement confidentiality. Now, the next would be the integrity of the information. How do we implement integrity to protect our valuable information assets? So we have, once again, two different facets of integrity protection. One is the actual protection of the integrity that says keep the bad guy away from it so that he can't cook the books. Well, just like protecting confidentiality, we implement integrity protection through access controls in crypto. If the bad guy can't physically get to the information asset, he can't alter it inappropriately, and therefore the integrity of the information remains high. Even if the bad guy can see, let's say, the encrypted information on a hard drive, because it's encrypted, he can't understand it. And if he can't understand it, he can't intelligently modify it inappropriately to his benefit, and therefore the integrity of the information is protected. So I'll use access controls and cryptography to protect the integrity of information. And remember that second facet of integrity deals with the verification of integrity at time of use. And the way we verify the integrity of information at time of use is typically using a mathematical function called a hashing function or a message digest. At time of known good, when the information was just created and we believe it is at its highest level of integrity, I'll run a hashing function on this information. And I'll establish something like a fingerprint for the information that is known to be good. This is done at time of creation. Then at time of use, the user will actually generate a new hash value for that information and compare his current hash value to the one that was taken at the time of known good, at time of creation. And if those two hash values are identical, integrity of the information has been verified. There hasn't been a single binary bit that has been altered in the information from the time it was known good until now at time of use. And the hashing function is used to verify that. Once again, this term message digest is just a synonymous term used for that same hashing function. So I'll use access controls and cryptography to protect the integrity of the information. I'll use a hashing function to verify the integrity of information at time of use. And finally, we're going to look at how availability is implemented. Typically, we will use redundancy, which means multiple copies of the information or of the information asset to provide a higher level of availability. 
redundancy, co-location, and fault tolerance. Keep the information assets available when I need them. Suppose I have a database that's in Oshkosh. I want to make sure it's highly available. In case my copy of the database in Oshkosh fails, a good idea is to make a second copy, a redundant copy, and I'll store it in Schenectady. And that way, if my copy in Oshkosh fails, I can simply roll over and read the data out of my Schenectady copy of the database. So that's redundancy. And I also mentioned in that scenario, co-location. I put the different copies in multiple locations so that if, let's say, the building were to burn down, if both of my copies are in the one building, I've lost both copies. So I want to distribute these copies so that if some disaster occurs on this one location, the other location still has its copy and I still have information that remains available. Fault tolerance generally says that we have the ability to withstand one failure, yet the information will remain available. Now, that doesn't mean I have two of anything. There are certain types of disk drive arrays called RAID arrays that will be one or more disks of fault tolerance, but you still will only have one copy of the data. And perhaps even RAID 5, a stripe set with parity, these are fault tolerant disk arrays. Well, the RAID 1 mirror set is actually both fault tolerant and provides data redundancy. So it has both. But the RAID 5 array, the stripe set with parity, is disk fault tolerant. I can lose one hard disk drive in this array of hard disk drives, and I can still access all of my data. However, I don't have a second copy of the data with a RAID 5 array. So fault tolerance says I can sustain one failure, yet I can still gain access to the information as I need it. So this provides us a high level of availability.